If you follow this channel for any length of time, you know I love to mountain bike. I've been doing it for three years solid, and you need to see what just landed in my backyard. In order to see that, you're going to want to sit back, you're going to want to relax, and you're going to want to check this out. <laughs> And before I get into the ins and outs of this ridiculous piece of technology that Trek has put out, make sure you hit that subscribe button as well as a little bell next to it so you're notified of all new videos. Here we go. So if you follow the channel for any length of time, you know that I have a Trek rail and I love this thing. I bought it from Trek, a 9.9, .9, and I built it into an even more badass mountain bike than it already was. But... In the last two years, I literally put 6,000 miles and three motors into this thing. And I was really concerned that the carbon fiber was going to finally crack. Not that I had any issues. I was astonished how strong carbon fiber actually was. But when I started looking around a little bit, I saw the new SRAM T-type transmission, quote unquote. But I couldn't find any information about a Trek rail with the T-type training on it. Well, guess what? I got one and I've ridden it so that you can know what I didn't before I bought this thing a couple of weeks ago. So here it is. Okay, real quick, let's go through some specs. This is a fourth generation 2024 Trek Rail 9.9. .9. Carbon fiber frame, one and an eighth inch lower head tube. It's got the Bosch Smart System. All of the rails have the 750 Bosch System, except for the smalls. Apparently the small bike still has the old 625 battery. Otherwise, they all have the 750s. Carbon fiber rims, SRAM code silver brakes, You've got the SRAM HS2 6 bolt 220 up front and the 200 in the rear for rotors. The RockShock Reverb AXS seat post dropper post 170 millimeter and it's a 150 on the small and medium. Up front you've got the Bontrager SE6 Team Issue rubber and the SE5 Team Issue in the rear and I'll tell you what. I'm not changing these till they wear out because these things work incredibly well so far in the Northeast. Of course they're 29s and of course they are tubeless. 
Up front, you've got the RockShox Zeb Ultimate with the Airwiz, the Debonair Spring, and the Charger 3 RC2 Damper. 160 millimeters of travel. And in the rear, you've got the RockShox Super Deluxe Through Shaft with the Airwiz with 150 millimeters of travel. But let's get to the good part. The rear derailleur is a SRAM XO Eagle AXS T-Type. The crank is a SRAM XO Eagle 34 tooth T-Type 160 millimeter crank length. We'll get to that. And the chain ring is 34 tooth steel SRAM XX. The cassette's a SRAM XS 1295 T-Type 10 to 52 12 speed. And the chain is an XO T-Type 12 speed flat top. And to wrap up that entire setup, the SRAM AXS Pod Ultimate is used for dropper post and shifting duties. Now let's get into my review of this bike, shall we? Now we've got the specs out of the way. Besides the mileage my old bike had, I also wanted to trade it in because I wanted the new T-Type transmission. And the only videos you could find were these. It's strong enough for me to stand on. I've never done that before. And telling you that this thing is the most amazing shifter ever because you can shift under load. If you've ever ridden an e-bike, you know that standing on the pedals when you're climbing up a hill and shifting gears will absolutely probably result in a snap chain. This little guy is supposed to completely alleviate that situation, meaning you can shift the harder you pedal, the better it shifts. So I took it out and tested it. I traded in my old bike for this bike to Goodales in Nashua, New Hampshire. And it's got a lot of advantages, but it also has a lot of drawbacks that nobody's talked about because the only video I could find on this was a couple of Russian guys sitting in front of these bikes and speaking in Russian. I had no idea what they were talking about. So I decided to get one because my old bike, I was afraid the carbon fiber was going to give up the ghost. Whether it was or not, I can't tell you. But I wanted this new SRAM system. So here we go. Okay, the first pro on this bike is the larger battery. Instead of having the 625, it's got the 750 watt battery in it. And I never had an issue with my old battery and I never actually ran my bike out of juice and I never had my battery fall out. But on this particular model, not only does the frame have what they claim is a beefier carbon fiber structure, but it has a larger battery and they've made adjustments inside so that the battery doesn't rattle, shake, anything like that, even though 6,000 miles on my old bike, I never ran into an issue. One thing the Trek has done that nobody seems to enjoy is they left the key. You need to have a key in order to pop your battery out, which can suck because one time I was on the West Coast and I live in the East Coast and I didn't have my key and I needed to pull the battery out to get at a cable. So I had to go to a Trek shop and have them put in a new lock, but that's neither here nor there. Okay, the second thing on the new generation four is the display in the selector switch for the modes. You can now select, you turn the button on right on the frame, and you can select up and down from the frame or from the handlebars, which on the old bike, you had a much larger kiosk or whatever it's called, and it was big and clumsy. The new one is incredibly streamlined. Now, originally, I took this all as a pro. This is all a good thing. It's a good upgrade. But the only issue with this is on the old bikes, you had the miles per hour and how many miles you had gone right in front of your face. This one doesn't have that at all. So if you want miles per hour, which you're going to want, you need to add an extra item, an extra display like the Bontrager Go Time or the Go Time Elite or whatever. So it's just adding more stuff. It really sucks that you have no idea how fast you're going and how many miles you've gone. But of course, you can always mount your cell phone with the Bosch Flow app to your handlebars. But on a mountain bike, there's a great chance you're going to crash. And there's also a great chance you're going to destroy your phone. Actually, I'm using this 
mount that I got from Amazon that was 30 bucks, and so far it works out really well. This has been a good setup. I've taken the bike out, but I haven't done any hardcore trails on it, but I've taken it out and it works pretty well because it holds your phone and it doesn't interfere with your phone setup in any way as far as sliding in your pocket. And it does seem to mount up rather nicely and it's very, very strong. Also, I'm using the Epic Tuning Chip app as the speedometer, even though it's in kilometers. Because I, if the Bosch Flow app does give you the speedometer capability, I haven't figured it out as of yet. So there's that. While we're on the topic of the Bosch Flow app, for the Generation 4, the Bosch Flow app is actually awesome. It allows you in eco touring e-mountain bike and turbo it allows you to bump up the assistance the bike gives you by a factor of five in both directions so you can jack it up so that it gives you five settings of extra help or five settings of less help it's very very customizable and i really enjoyed this the only issue with this is if you want to watch this while you're riding you have to strap a uh, you have to strap a cell phone to your handlebars and speaking of handlebars, Trek hooks you up with their $400 limited series carbon fiber handlebars that have no gooseneck. It's all one solid integrated piece. But the only issue with that is they're not round all the way down. They come out to a large taper, which makes it almost impossible to put headlights or anything else that you'd normally put next to the gooseneck on the bike it makes it almost impossible to mount them. But they are clean, they are incredibly light, and they're supposed to be phenomenally strong. Time will tell. This is what it looks like with a Lupine Alpha headlight and a Nightcore backup headlight. It's still pretty clean, even though they're a little crooked, but it works. So I'm going to stick with it. And before we get any further, let me remind you to smash, smash, smash that like button because it helps the channel. Now let's get back to the Trek rail. When you buy a new rail, they kind of hook you up much better than they used to. They give you an air pump so you can pump up the front and rear shocks, no problem. It's a good one, but it's not great. They give you a charger for the one SRAM battery you need for the dropper post. They give you a really gay little bell that I would never use in a million years, but it's a nice thought. And they give you a charger. Now, if you've owned a Trek rail, the old Boss chargers used to get piping scary hot. The new ones, they don't. That's one thing I can tell you for a fact, and that's awesome. The new plug is in the same place as the old plug, but it's a new proprietary interface. So you can't use an old Boss charger on this. You've got to use the new one, which is cool. I never had any issues with the battery door on the old bike. And again, 6,000 miles. And she looked good when I, when I traded her in. Another thing they supply you with is the replacement pads for the AXS pods. Because I simply bumped into the bike on my patio and knocked one of the pads off. Yeah, they come off that easy. And I've seen them on forums. They're fairly new and nothing a little bit of super glue can't fix. But you need these pods to shift the bike and raise and lower your dropper post. So they're pretty important but they do give you four replacements. And again, I knocked one off doing absolutely nothing. So that's a little worrisome. When I was researching these, I was worried about everybody saying that Trek stretched the frame to fit the larger battery, but it made no difference. I don't even notice it. And I'm not tall in any way whatsoever at all. I'm 230, five foot 10. But I'll tell you one thing, the turning radius with the knock block 2.0 is far greater because the forks don't come in contact with a carbon fiber frame at all. So that is a clear win. Now one thing I was really concerned about when I was looking at the specs of this bike, out of all the Trek rails, the Trek rail T-Type has 160 millimeter cranks and I couldn't figure that out. And I was already trying to order 165s or 170s because I thought 160s were gonna be an issue they aren't in any way whatsoever at all, and you do actually get better rock clearance. Of course, they come with garbage nylon pedals, but I already swapped them out. 
So that, in my opinion, is a win. I spoke to one of the technicians at Trek, and they told me that 160 is the way they're going with all the bikes in the future. Where I mountain bike, it's incredibly rocky and pedal strikes are just every day. I had very little pedal strikes. And one other thing I'd like to include is I had a Trek rail, a 2021 Generation 3 9.9 .9 XTR, and this bike handles, rides, and is much faster than my other bike. I don't know how else to explain it. It's crazy. I thought when I got a Trek rail to replace my old Trek rail, it would just be more of the same, but this is an entirely different bike, good, bad, or indifferent. I got to put that out there. It's fast. And speaking of fast, with no speedometer, the first couple of times I rode it, the limiter kicked in and I had no idea how fast I was going and I was positive I wasn't doing 20 miles an hour yet. You know how the bike kicks in? It's like someone's putting the brakes on. So before I even had the bike delivered, I had already ordered an Epic chip from Epic Chip Tuning in Australia. This tuning chip allows you to go past the 20 mile an hour limit that's on the bike and I had my old bike firmware updated at several shops, Trek dealerships, as well as the new bike firmware updated with the Epic tuning chip in it, and it doesn't cause any issues whatsoever at all. I ran the tuning chip in my old Trek rail for, well, two years. Two years with no issues whatsoever at all. And they have a chip for the smart, the smart system, the older systems, and everything in between. And these guys ship from Australia like they're right down the street. They ship faster than in most American countries. And I don't understand how that is, but whatever. They're a good company, and if you have any issues, they get right back to you. I have absolutely no affiliation. I'm just a satisfied customer. Now, if you have any skills whatsoever at all, installing this is easy. This is a brand new bike I believe I rode once, and I'm already installing the chip. The one thing that I did wrong is I didn't apply liquid electrical tape to the connectors and then rode it on a very wet road and I ended up getting a code. But the code is easy. It didn't put the bike in limp mode. It just gave me an orange light and that was it. No big deal. The bike still works like a champ. And the beauty about this is now you've got the Bosch Flow app and you also have the Epic Tuning app which allows you to do all sorts of customization to set the bike up exactly the way you want it. It's phenomenal. And unlike the Generation 3, there's no you don't have to do anything special to turn it on when you turn the bike on or anything special to turn it off when you turn the bike off. That's a score, as far as I'm concerned. At any rate, let's get to some of the bad stuff. Well, actually, let me show you the uh, Epic Tuning Chip real quick. You simply turn the app on, it scans to pick up the chip, you click on it, easy peasy, it shows you this. You can't set it to miles, it's still on kilometers. I talked to the guys and they said it is what it is. You can have it so it unlocks automatically whenever you turn the bike on, which is what you want to do. And then it gives you a variety of settings. User mapping, E plus mappings, race mappings, all this other stuff that I haven't even learned how to use quite yet, as well as a code immobilizer. Do not turn the code immobilizer on. I thought it was a good thing. It actually caused a code. So don't do that. At any rate, I'll leave a link below if you're interested. Now, let's get to the bad stuff. Now, this may not necessarily be bad. But here's what the motor sounds like when you're cranking away on a flat surface. Compared to my old rail, it's basically the same. It sounds good and it seems to quiet down when you're on the trail, but it's very tough to tell. But to me, it's not noisy in any way at all. That sounds like garbage, man. So living in the Northeast, a lot of the mountain biking I do involves crossing through water. It is what it is. And on my old bike, I had four piston XTR Shimano's. 
and they were totally bulletproof. You could go through all the mud and water you wanted, and they stayed relatively quiet. The SRAM code silvers that come on the 9.9 suck. And when I say they suck, they suck. I broke these things in because I run $6,000 brakes on my 4Runner, and you have to break the pads in when you first get the bike. And I did the same thing with this thing. Not only are they loud as all get out, but it sounds like the rear of the bike is breaking. They just sound terrible. So after spending everything I spent on this bike, I still have to swap out the brakes and put better ones in. I've heard about SRAM's brakes sucking, but I mean, this is ridiculous. These brakes suck and they shouldn't put them on mountain bikes, in my honest, unbiased opinion. So the next thing isn't necessarily bad, but I just don't understand the reason for it, and that's the AirWiz. The front forks have the AirWiz set up on it, the tires have the AirWiz set up on it, and the rear shock has the AirWiz set up on it. Now, it helps you set your bike up for your weight, etc. And using the SRAM app, you can set your front forks up to the exact air pressure for your weight, as well as the rear shock for your weight, the exact pressure, and then the tire pressure. But to be perfectly honest, I don't see any other advantage to it. It's just another app that I have to use. I'm already using the Bosch Flow app. I'm already using the Epic app, and now the SRAM app. But I mean, once you set your suspension up, you're pretty much good to go. Unless there's other features to this that I'm completely missing, but otherwise, I would have liked to have taken the money for the AirWiz and put it someplace else on this particular bike because there's other things that it could use as opposed to flashing red LEDs, but whatever. But otherwise, it's just things to fail, and I would rather have seen the money spent elsewhere like putting XTR brakes on this thing. I don't see any advantage to it. Maybe I'm missing the point, but I don't believe I am. I can set up my front forks and my rear shock for my weight and style of riding by myself. It's easy enough, one and done. So the AirWiz, it's not necessarily bad, I just don't see the point in it. You see what I'm saying? Money could have been spent better elsewhere, JMO. Now this isn't a bad thing. This is the new SRAM T-Type transmission. So far, I've got about 60 miles on this bike. So far, this thing has been pretty much bulletproof. It definitely shifts way better than my XTR shifter. And here's something I didn't know, and it doesn't tell you any place, but I was concerned about this particular setup because I kept thinking, what if you're out in the woods and your battery dies? Now you can't shift. Well, Trek has wired the battery for the SRAM AXS T-Type derailleur directly to the e-bike's battery. So you don't have to worry about that battery. The only battery you have to be concerned about on this entire bike is the dropper post. But, if you happen to rip the wiring out or something wacky happens, you can run it with a regular AXS battery. That's something they don't tell you in any of the literature, which, it was a concern. It was almost a deal breaker. But Trek has the battery for the rear derailleur wired directly to the e-bike's motor, which is awesome! So as you can see, I tried to get footage of it in action, but it's next to impossible. You can't mount a GoPro, or I can't figure out how to mount a GoPro to show you how well this thing works. But it does. Where I, where I ride, there's a lot of rocky hill climbs, and these are not groomed mountain bike trails. They're just trails. And this thing worked incredibly well. Because my biggest fear is always... Do not stand up and pedal when you're in a sticky situation and don't ever consider shifting with a traditional derailleur because something bad will happen. 
So far, with the T-Type setup, that hasn't happened. And another bonus is, remember trying to dial in your rear derailleur? Even running the Shimano XTR, perfectly lubricated, perfectly dialed in, no matter what, every third or fourth mountain biking trip, somehow the, sh the derailleur would get knocked out of position and you'd have to repair it and repair it and repair it. Not only that is with the XTR, even with the XTR chain, the M9100, you still could not stand up pedal and shift at the same time, you were absolutely probably going to break the chain. With the T-Type transmission, so far, that is not the case. The harder you pedal, literally, the better it shifts. That is not a joke, no lie, and you no longer have the universal derailleur hanger to bend in the rear because you don't need it. This thing is built like a brick shithouse. So with all that being said, the SRAM T-Type transmission system appears to be very, very legit. It's made so much more robust than the Shimano XTR or even the AXS system, but I do carry a spare with me just in case because when I'm on the road, I'm not looking to go to a Trek dealer and wait for them to order the parts. You can add the T-Type tr transmission to your existing mountain bike if you so choose to. They have the entire setup, the only thing I'm curious about is why they went with XO instead of XX on the 9.9 .9 rail because you can't really get a much better bike than the 99 .9 rail except for the Trek CXR. At any rate, I hope this video was informative. I'm not some mountain biking expert, but I've owned seven e-bikes in the last couple of years and the Trek rail is a monster and it appears besides a few little issues like the brakes, no display, and having the air whiz, this bike is serious and it does look pretty badass. At any rate, if you enjoyed this video, make sure you hit that like, share, and subscribe. Leave a comment below and I will try to return the favor. I am out.